Good morning, and uh, welcome to the Waynesboro Seventh-day Adventist Church uh, Sabbath School. Uh, we're glad that you've joined us online, and uh, those of us that are in the sanctuary here, uh, welcome to each one of you. Uh, we pray that you'll be blessed uh, by this uh, study of our, our lesson title is the Death in a Sinful World. So it's like, uh, this should be an interesting study that uh, as we watch the news today, we can see that things haven't improved a lot. No, death's still with us. Yeah. Let's, uh, let's begin with the word of prayer. Father in heaven, Lord, I pray that uh, you would guide us as uh, we study your word. Uh, may your Holy Spirit attend us. Uh, may you uh, speak to our hearts and to our minds. May you uh, guide us uh, by your, your very hand, Lord. Bless those that uh, could not be here today, Lord, for whatever reason. I pray that uh, that you would send angels of comfort uh, to strengthen them and to, to be with them. And may your spirit abide in their hearts. Bless us now, Lord, as we open your word. Speak to us, we pray. In the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. It's kind of an interesting uh, picture, isn't it? And the quarterly here it uh, shows a, a foot with a serpent about to strike. Kind of, uh, you think about the, the creation story and how God said everything was perfect, very good. And then things changed. You ever, have you ever had a situation like that in your life where everything's going great and then all of a sudden, bang, a tire blows out or, you know, right, right at the least most opportune time and... Uh, or your compressor goes out on Sabbath morning. Or your compressor goes <laughs> out or, <laughs> yes. you know, you, you start having palpitations have to go to the hospital or, you know, that life throws us curves sometimes, but do any of them take God by surprise? No. God has his eyes on us and he understands uh, when we're going through these difficult times and sometimes it's hard. We feel like we're, we're all by ourselves. But we remember Paul and Silas in the prison, right? After they had the smithereens beat out of them. And what are they doing? Singing hymns. So we, we need to, to learn that these, these, all these stories in the Bible are not just cute stories. But their instruction for us, and they give us insight uh, when we're dealing through difficult times, when uh, the serpent comes to light. I think you you may you may hear a sermon in the near future about serpents. I don't know. I just got a rumor about that. It's kind of uh, amazing, but yet still a mystery as to what happened in the Garden of Eden. There it was and perfect. And yet, uh, we see some lessons there. And one of the lessons that we see is that as God warned Adam and Eve about uh, not e eating of the tree, why would he warn them what would be the reason? Love. Because he loved them? Yes. What else? Give them freedom of choice. Just. Yeah. Yep. Freedom of choice. Otherwise, why would he have had to warn them? If they didn't have freedom of choice. You know, it's also interesting, uh, Richard, that uh, you think about everything to this point was perfect. Yeah. You know well, that... Well, it was the same way in heaven. Yeah. Every, everything was going really good. And, you know, it, it's not like Adam and Eve had to go scrounging in the deep woods to find an acorn to eat. I mean, the whole place was a bountiful of full of fruit and not just any old fruit it was perfect fruit you know that uh, 
all, all these things that God had provided, he provided for all their needs. It wasn't like they were in want or need or they were paupers or... Yes? Right, let's, let's change the scenario. Okay. Adam and Eve is there. They obey God. Okay? Be fruitful and multiply. She has two boys. Boys are most than likely mischievous. What if Cain... I'm picking Cain out because he's the one... They want to do his own thing, had that apple. Would the rest of the family have taken a bite of that apple to follow Cain? Or would they just say, up you go, son, see you later, we'll make more? I mean, that, that could have happened. So it's, it's a, you know, it would, I think eventually it was going to happen. Yeah. It, I think it's just too hard. You have two people to obey God, then you have three, then four, and they multiplied. She was busy. Some one of the kids would have messed up. Peggy, I tend to think. Um, I mean, I understand what I is saying, but I tend to think that if Adam and Eve had never fallen, that their children probably would not have fallen either. But once sin started, then um, there was no stopping it. Could, could we uh, make a parallel between COVID-19 and sin? That it's a very infectious thing. It's easy. It's easy to catch. <clears throat> we see how you know that this this thing can spread so quickly once it finds a host. And but you know if everybody had perfect immunity, you would say, well, you know. Well, COVID would never have a chance, but you know, what, what has happened to the human condition since the time of the garden? Going downhill. Yep. Okay. My question is, if Adam and Eve had never sinned, how long would Satan have been allowed to bother the people of this planet? How long was he allowed to bother the people of other planets before uh, they, they never sinned and then he was, you know, was it continuous? Was it always? Was it was there a point where God said, "Okay, you know that's enough. You've bothered them enough. They aren't they aren't falling for your schemes, and so you know you can't continue to bother them anymore." Uh, it's just something to wonder. Well, I think there was some other reason there, and the reason that I think there's something else is that whenever Jesus and God the Father and God the Holy Spirit got together to decide how to create the world and what they were going to do. And Lucifer, being the head angel, was not included. Right. And because he wasn't included, he began to feel bad about himself. Well, or what shall I say, he began to feel sorry for himself, as it were. And so he began to do things in heaven to uh, get to Christ. And to uh, actually he started a, a war yes. with Christ. So after he got cast out of heaven, where would he go and where could he cause the most hurt to Christ? The world he just created. So he came here specifically to be able to cause hurt to God, to Christ and the Father and the Holy Spirit, because they did not include him in what took place when they created the world. Now, put yourself in the place of uh, Eve. And when you read uh, Genesis 3, 1 to 4, and all those words that Satan and, they, and Eve, uh, why do you, uh, what do you think? Why she might have, uh, through these words, listen to what he had to say. Why do you think she gave in? Well, I think as soon as she wandered too close to the tree, she had already let her guard down. 
Okay. And the closer she got to the tree, the more her guard came down. And that made her more susceptible to the words of Satan. It made it easier for him to convince her. They were supposed to stay away from the tree. And when she did not do that and started walking, her curiosity got And then they, yeah, they were supposed to stay together, not wander from each other's side. So, um, because what is it said? I think it's in Ecclesiastes where it says about, um, you know, we need each other and that a two-fold cord, a three-fold cord is the best, but when, mm -hmm. you know, you need... You need someone to help you stay strong. And they were supposed to do that for each other. Do you think that's true in the church as well? Well, sure. Yeah. It's, it's one of the benefits of church attendance is when we're feeling tempted, when we're feeling attacked, that we can draw strength from one another, encouraged you know, to resist the depression or the anger or the the yeah. jealousy or whatever it is that uh, that Satan, you know, the, the soup of the day, whatever Satan is serving, you know, that uh, we can resist those things. This idea of how hard is it to be content? Well, let's think about it a little bit. Did you sweet talk your wife at any time? How did you get her to talk? To marry you. Just think of it a little bit. <laughs> Satan was sweet talking Eve. I'm sure he had a Now, voice. why did she and what criteria did she use to make her decision on? She used her five senses. That's how Satan got to her through, through her. Through she Satan. used her senses. How she felt, what it looked like, and how good it was seemed to be. See? She didn't. So, she didn't. but what should she have really made her decision on? That's what sad. criteria? Not to even go near that tree. She well, where was it. Adam? Come on, what was he doing that was so busy that he couldn't realize that he wasn't around? I'm sorry, I'm, I'm looking at the other side. Stay away from the tree. What? <laughs> <laughs> should have paid attention to it. Thus saith the Lord. Have you ever noticed? That's right. That's what she should have been making her decision on. God's word. Trust and obey. That's right. Yeah, trust and obey. For, the, for, the, for those that uh, have a few years on you when they used to do cigarette commercials, some of you here are old enough. I know many of you aren't. But... They, they would always show the the big handsome guy with the, the rippling muscles and the, the beautiful girls all hanging off him and he's smoking a cigarette. He this looks so cool. The cowboy. The American cowboy. You know, but then does the devil ever show you 30 years in, in the in the future when that guy's dragging the oxygen tank behind him and he can't make it up a he's flight of steps? Sure the can. devil never shows you the truth. He only shows you some glamour, some painted up picture to try to make you think that you're missing out on something. Mm -hmm. When in reality, if we would obey God, you know that... Uh, We'd be much better off. Yeah. Well, as in fact, when he did to he, he tried to show her, hey, God's keeping something from you. You're not getting everything that... Well, God's just not truthful. Hey, who was it that was telling the lie? Yeah. It wasn't God. And she had no she had no expectations of what lies were because the No, Lord she didn't. Perfect. She no one has ever lied to her before, so no. how would she be cautious of what he was saying? No, she, she, she had to be wholeheartedly because he's he's sitting there, he's saying, Look, I ate of the fruit. I'm I'm here, I'm still alive. Nothing happened to me. Right. So why so, did she have any reason to doubt what the serpent's saying to her? She was never lied to. She, no. she shouldn't have been. There. Not like whenever if I sweet talked to right. a woman and lied to her about how I could give her the moon and the sun and all the, all these wonderful things. Why, uh, she was so infatuated over it that she believed me. You see, it's the same way with with Satan, we have taken upon ourselves 
a character like Christ, like uh, Satan's, rather than a character like Christ. And uh, in doing so, the serpent has had the upper hand. And once he gets the upper hand, what does he do? It, he now uses Eve to get to Adam. And it's the same way in these days. Lisa? Um, I often wonder, because everyone always says that Eve wandered away from Adam, but the Bible just says in, um, in verse 6 that she also gave to her husband with her, and he ate. So it makes it sound like that he was there with her at the tree. I mean, every time I read that, and then I hear everybody else saying, well, she wandered away. Did she really? Or was he just allowing her to make the decision and he was there also? Because it says that he was with her. Yeah. At the same time, though. I'm just saying. <laughs> at the same time, though. I agree with Lisa. <laughs> no, I don't, think, I don't think they were together. No. Um, the thing of it is, is that you can be in the same house, but not in the same room. So you get a phone call and um, somebody, and somebody asks, you know, is your husband there? Yeah, let me get him. He's in a different part of the house or he's in a different room. He's not with me in this room. Well, so he was we, with her in the garden. They were both in the garden, but they were not in the same place in the garden like they should have been. So, so like, well, whether, whether or not he was or wasn't or whatever, hey, we should take God at his word. Right. I just that's would you like to hear what the prophet says? And that's what yeah. uh, is God is trying to tell us. In Patriots and Prophets it yes. says they were not together in the garden. Yes. Page fifty three. Okay. Basically basically it states that uh, the angels warned Adam and Eve to be on guard against uh, the devices of Satan for his efforts to ensnare would uh, uh, them would be un unwary. Uh, while they were obedient to God, the evil one could not harm them. For if they needed uh, needed be, every angel in heaven would have been sent to their help. And then the next paragraph says, The angels had cautioned Eve to be aware of separating herself from her husband while occupied in her daily labor in the garden. With him, she would be of less danger from temptation than if she were alone. But absorbed in her pleasing task, she unconsciously wandered from the side. On perceiving that she was alone, she felt an appreh apprehension of danger, but she dismissed her fears, deciding that she had sufficient wisdom and strength to discern evil and to withstand it, as the prophet speaking. That's uh, self-efficiency. Yes. And really, to live in heaven, we may have to deny self every day self-denying love, a self-sacrificing love for God and for our fellow men. That's the only way we can do it. Now, Satan started out by uh, creating doubt, and then he told a lie. What was this lie? I'm not sure I'm not sure we die. I'm not sure we die. You will not die. Is he still telling that lie today? Oh, yes. How's he telling it today? He tells it through the fact that people believe that when they die, they go to heaven. They don't actually stay in the grave. Okay. So they don't really die. The it's body a, dies, but not the rest of them doesn't die. It's the issue okay. of a mortal soul. Yeah. Right? And yeah. That, but the Bible is strictly says that only God has immortality. That we do not have any kind of immortality. Not right now, anyways. Well, uh, <clears throat> this immortality of the soul. Why do you think that God put Adam and Eve back into the dust of the earth? Hey. For the same reason we be put we're put there. Why do you think he did it that way? Well, he said, "Of dust you were created, and of dust you shall return. Mm -hmm. You return back to the dust." To make sure it didn't stay here at this point. Did the dust make itself alive? No. 
<clears throat> you made the dust alive. I did. I did. So the dust doesn't have any uh, internal attributes of God, does it? In and of itself. It's only when, when God lives in our heart that we receive some of those attributes from God. And when he said that he made us in his, in his image, it was because what happened at the creation? Jesus breathed the breath of life into his nostrils and it became a living soul. When God breathes, the breath is also used in the Bible to, to represent the Holy Spirit. When God breathes into our souls, he brings life. When we're absent of his presence, death soon follows. Spiritual death and then physical death. Now, now imagine Adam and Eve, they've never seen a wilted leaf, never seen rotten fruit. Everything was, was perfect. No, no locust eating leaves. I mean, it's just everything. There was a, there was a natural balance in everything. Well, how long do you think Adam and Eve could have uh, suffered and endured to see the effects of sin? Could they have endured to, like we hear the? They're being preached in many uh, Christian assemblies that you don't die, you go to, to heaven. Uh, do you think they could have endured to see what is happening in our world today? Don't you think that was merciful of our God? Yes. I think that's one reason. Then I can think of another reason. Did Adam and Eve know what death was like before they had sinned? No. 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 They had no idea. Do you really know what death is like? No. What difference does it make? No. Nope. Die anyway. Well, <laughs> no. unless the Lord comes before that time. Yeah. But we don't know. All right. <clears throat> then, supposing I make a choice of not following God and when the time comes and I die and, and then I am resurrected for all are resurrected whether you're wicked or whether you're righteous everyone is resurrected at some point. and so and here I am to face the second death do you think I need to know what death is like there's the first death and God tells me, hey, this is what death is like. Only one difference. You aren't resurrected from the second death. You are no. not to be saved. No. It is death and, and nothing. Therefore, it is said in God's word, we have once to die. Yeah. <clears throat> we don't have to die that second death. Why? Because of the promise. That's right. Now, That's how far back does you think that promise went? From the beginning. The beginning. The Bible says before the foundation of the world. Yeah. It was before the foundation of the world. So really, what is the consequences for sin on Wednesday's party? What is the consequences for sin? For disobedience? Well, the Roman says that the way to sin is death. Death. Right. Pretty, pretty abrupt. So, death. We have people, we have people uh, who say they, uh, what, what do they call that? Where you uh, come back from the well, dead. Or whatever it is. <laughs> yeah. Uh, coming back from a, a, a near, near death experience. Yeah. yeah. What is that? An NDE, I think, is what they call it. <coughs> Well, in all of that, did uh, anyone ever say about Christ in explaining their and the uh, 
near death experience. Yeah, near death experience. You know, I, I, I never mentioned that. I have, I have witnessed it on the ambulance. Yeah. That uh, I was fortunate enough to participate in a couple of resuscitations from people who were without a pulse and were not breathing. And that was with help with CPR and, and drugs and, and uh, God's permission. That these people, for all intents and purposes. Now, death is an interesting thing because. Clinically dead means the moment that your heart stops and you stop breathing. That's clinically dead. But what happens immediately upon this clinical death, that there's a biological death that begins. And this process lasts for six to ten minutes. Six to ten minutes, what happens is the cells begin to deteriorate to the point where they cannot respond again. There is one exception to that, and that's called cold water drowning where they've had people that have fallen into frozen lakes and stuff and they've been resuscitated an hour or so after being fished out of the water. And there's a thing called a mammalian uh, reflex that happens that uh, basically it's almost like, uh, like what happens to frogs and stuff, that the heart rate <clears throat> slows way down and they appear dead. But there's just enough circulation that it keeps things viable for that time and the cold temperatures also slow down this process of deterioration but once that, that, that 10 minutes goes by and that brain cells begin to die, there's no coming back from that except God's resurrection. And that's scientifically proven. You know, that's, so I don't know what these, what these people talk about. Uh, I, I, I've watched these people. They were dead. I was doing CPR on them, breathing in their mouth. And the next thing you know, their eyes open. And then I tell you what, it, it's... It's an amazing experience to see that. Now, I, I also talked to a guy in the ambulance one time that uh, he he had uh, died on the on the uh, table. And they were his heart stopped, and he, he explained to me that that when he, he died, he just he could still hear, but he couldn't see, he couldn't move. And he says when they when they shot him, he said all he saw was like this flash. And a, and a tremendous pain. He said, it said felt like somebody hit him in the chest with a sledgehammer. But he didn't talk about seeing golden gates and the angels flying around or anything like that. He said it was it was crazy. Yes. Now, many of you don't know, but there we did have a pastor, Pastor House, his wife Ingalisa. She was on the operating table and she said she died three times and she did see heaven. Mm -hmm. So here it is a Christian and she's saying she did see it. So there's got to be something there. But she said, um, uh, Elaine Petullo is really close to Ingalisa. You, do you remember Ingalisa? Not Elaine. Elaine knew Ingalisa for a long time. Ingalisa, she... Oh, yes, yeah, Ingalisa. Yeah, yeah. There, are, there are biological things that happen to the body as it's going through this um, hypoxia, brain hypoxia, that you, know, you get hallucinations and things like that. that uh, you know, maybe maybe God does do a fast run a fast movie through your head. You know, just uh, I don't know. I've never been there, so uh, yeah, we don't know about. No, when we get there, I guess we'll we'll know the answer to that for sure. But the Bible says that the wages of the sin is death, and right. And so, well, what real proof do we have of anything except to believe God's word of God and what He says? Yep. Yeah. And Satan is going to use this 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 false narrative that he started yeah. as to deceive He's even the very elect. Yeah. He's out to uh, uh, well, he's the father, <clears throat> and not only is he a liar, but he is also a murderer. Because what? Who is responsible for for the sin? It's not God. No. No. It's Satan who's responsible for sin. So, he's the one who started it. And I have the choice of whether I want to go along with what he's in. But if I give in just once, just look how it's spread mm -hmm. from the time of Eden until now. And how there are killings, how there are 
all kinds of corruption and all that sort of thing going on in our world. Hey, if it continues the way it is, eventually sin will destroy itself. So, God in His great mercy is going to shorten in righteousness. In other words, before it gets to the point of where it will destroy itself. A good illustration of that is our homosexual things. Hey, can two of the same sex reproduce? No. So since they can't reproduce, the uh, they're operating outside of the creation model. Yeah, they are not only that, but hey, humans will cease to exist. Richard? I don't know if I should bring this up, but I'm going to. Satan is upset with Christ because Satan cannot procreate. Only humans no. can procreate. Yes. Okay? Only God. Satan has gone so far in this world right now that they're doing something called transgenderism. Mm -hmm. Where a guy thinks he's a female, or a male thinks, or a, a female thinks she's a male, mm -hmm. they can go and have an operation. They're doing operations on kids mm -hmm. from the age of zero at birth, or before birth, to age 17. And they're not letting the parents know anything about this. Okay? So it's getting, we're gonna have a generation of people who cannot procreate. And that's Satan's main goal right there. He's trying yeah. to destroy the, the whole the whole, the whole human race. God See, began in Eden. That gives us evidence that we should believe God. That's right. And follow his word. See? Now hey, most times we're pretty intelligent to catch on long before a lot of these things happen. But hey, they, the, the things that happen in life are not only Satan's work, but God uses them to help teach us a lesson of some sort. So, hey, I need to learn as well as other people need to learn. Mm -hmm. So really, do I know God? That's a question I have to ask myself. An interesting thing we can we can learn from the military. If a, a soldier, do, do soldiers wear orange on the battlefield? No. No, they try to make themselves blend into the environment. They they, they want to be hidden. Most medics don't even wear a red cross right. on the battlefield. So Satan, when he's devising this lie, do you think he wants to spray paint it orange so it's real obvious? No, he camouflages it, makes it seem like, well, that's just a bush. And that that is not there's not a rifle in there that's gonna kill me. It's just a bush. And the, the the devil does the same thing with temptations. You know what we're seeing is, you know what did he he, he told Samuel, you know when they rejected uh, God and then wanted a king. He says you're not rejecting you Samuel. They're rejecting me. When we reject the word of God, we're not just rejecting the pastor or a denomination. We're rejecting God. You know, we have to think about that. that you know, this, this, this word that's contained in here, if, if we say no to this, I don't believe this, who are, who are we really saying it to? When we give, give Bible studies, we hand out tracts that I don't believe in that. You know, you guys are a bunch of Bible thumpers. Who are they saying that to? God. God. Why do we take it personal? Why do we get our feelings hurt? We're so afraid to, to say things because we're afraid of rejection. Was David afraid of rejection? Yeah. When he went to face when he went to face Goliath. No. All of his other compadres were mm -hmm. because they were letting Goliath bad mouth God. Okay. When we sin, we don't sin against anybody except God. We can sin against each other yeah, and ourselves. Yeah, but, we but ultimately, our sin, sin is against God. God. Yeah. But we can sin against each uh, other and sure. even sin against ourselves. 
Yeah, that, that idea of sticks and stones don't don't break bones. That's a bunch of baloney. You know, yeah, words is. are brutal sometimes. And when we we say things to one another, we can. It's like being beaten with a club sometimes. Yes, Peggy. Well, before we get before we only have five minutes left, which you're going to have in about a minute, we need to look at Thursday because we need to look at the gospel promise that was given. And what is that? That we have a Savior coming. Well, He's already come, but back then to Adam and Eve, that was the hope that they were given. Where was that yes. promise first yes. given? Genesis three fifteen. And. Genesis 3, 21. The gospel was preached. Yep. And who was it preached to? The first people. <coughs> right. So, what is our job? Preach the gospel. Preach the gospel. That there has been a, uh, made a way out for us to okay. escape this, this snare of sin. Now, this is, this is one of Satan's lies. He says, well, as long as you believe the gospel, you don't have to do the other thing. Tell me, if you really believe, or if Adam and Eve really believed when God said, don't touch that tree, don't eat of that fruit, do you think they would have ate of it? No, they doubted it. So they weren't obedient. And disobedience is transgression of the law. The law is God's <clears throat> word. So uh, the gospel, if you preach the gospel, then you have to. What about all these different teachings in God's word? From that of uh, uh, a uh, immortal soul, to that of the sad, to that of all, all the other teachings that are the truth in God's word. They are the things that help teach the gospel. They are what these, uh, what shall I say, teachings or, or uh, what, they, what the Bible teaches are to help us to understand about God and what God has, and wants us to do and how the gospel can be preached. So uh, every true doctrine in the Bible tells us about Christ. That's why when people have these uh, near-death experiences, they don't say anything about Christ because it's not the truth. And therefore, many of these people that have had these experiences are far from being a Christian any longer, less than what they were before they had it. So, uh, hey, let's turn to our God. Now, Peggy, what was you going to say? I'm sorry, I kept running up. Oh, well, that's, oh. that's okay. You basically went where I was going to go. I was simply going to say the gospel is not just the story of Jesus' death and resurrection. The gospel is the whole Bible. Yes. And if you leave out any of the teachings of Christ and any of the teachings of the Word of God, you have left out part of the gospel. Yes, you have left out what Christ is, wants to do Correct. for the human race. Uh, let's see, where was I on this? The whole Bible is the story of, of Jesus okay. and his salvation. The whole Bible is the whole story. If you leave off any part of it, you don't have the whole story. If I only believe in the New Testament, and I say I'm only a New Testament Christian, and the Old Testament is... Box mix. I don't have the whole story. I don't have everything leading <clears throat> up to Christ's death and resurrection. I've left off all this important stuff, and therefore I never have the whole story. Frank, you got anything to add to Thursday's part? Basically, uh, you know, the, this gospel, I mean, Ellen White tells us that uh, there's nothing more important or should take the place of us sounding the, the call that we find in Revelation 14 verses uh, 6 through 12 which is the judgment hour has come and a call to, to come out and then that Babylon has fallen that is our prime directive 
that there's nothing else that she says should take precedence over that message because there is a world out there that is listening to the lies of Satan that says you can sin and go to heaven. But we know that that, that is not true. How do we know that? God has told us. Yeah, God has told us very clearly. There is no nuance to that. There's nothing that we have to use a slide rule to figure out. You don't have to be an engineer or speak a, a exotic language to understand it. That the wages of sin and death, and we've seen death. And I remember as a child, when my, my little Dodson got run over by, by a mail truck. That was my first experience with death face to face, and I tell you what, I was so angry. Yes, babe. You have to remember that there is more to that scripture than grief, but the grace of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. So when we come to Him, He takes care of our sins. But that doesn't give us permission to keep sinning. He covers our sins Correct. with His blood. Yes. And He clothes us with the his robe of His righteousness. Correct. It's not our righteousness that gets us into heaven. We don't have it to. is His righteousness. <laughs> and so that doesn't mean that we shouldn't try, that we shouldn't try to learn to know what it is that the truth is, because if we don't put forth the effort, hey, we'll never learn, and we won't be able to learn how to make the right free choice. And you, hey, Satan was able to make a choice. The angels were able to make a choice in heaven. Do you think that if we don't make the right choice that we will go to heaven? Satan was cast out. So, hey, maybe, maybe we just can't do nothing about where we are and the circumstances that we are in. But we can make a choice. Even if we are in a bad situation. The Elijah message was choose this day whom you will serve, whether you will serve Baal or whether you will serve God. And that decision is made by every time we pick up a book, we ask ourselves, is, is this book speaking of God or of Satan? Is this television program that I'm watching is it speaking of God or is it speaking of Satan? We make choices every time I sit in front of a plate. Is this food bringing me closer to God or taking me away? And so everything that we do, everything that we say, we, what does the Bible say? That do all to the glory of God. And, God. and so we need to, to make this decision moment by moment, breath by breath. And that's the second. Man. Yes. That means you and I. <laughs> so let's have a word of prayer. Father in heaven, we thank you, O oh Lord, for your loving kindness. We thank you for the warnings that you have loved us so much that you will warn us about where we're going and what's going to happen to us. And uh, just because you know what was going to happen to us when we take the wrong road, or what will happen to us if we take the right road does not mean that we do not have a choice because we do. We can choose to serve you and like Joshua said, as for me and my house, we are going to serve the Lord. Amen. Now, maybe we will fall and most likely we will because we are no match for Satan. And so, what we can do is choose to serve you and you will either find a way to relieve us of the problems that we have or a way out or you will give us the strength to endure. You have made that promise. And so may this be our hope and our joy of your salvation. In Jesus' name, amen.